So welcome to Sunday night at Father's house. Um, Rob and I were having a conversation about communion today. Um, Probably in the light of um, the fact that yesterday was an election, we were just thinking about, obviously, time election time sort of maybe highlight the differences we have particularly in our values or our beliefs which party we vote for all of those sorts of things so it's sort of this time of increased awareness of how we're different from each other and we were talking about how in communion um, the table is a great leveler because we're not different at the table of the Lord we're all the same doesn't matter, um, you know, how much money we have, how little money we have. Um, it doesn't matter if we're a sinner, if we're not a sinner, we're all welcome. And uh, we're talking about um, even, you know, when you listen to the story of the Last Supper, and particularly we're having this conversation about the disciples, and I think we have this assumption that they all had the same beliefs, which they fundamentally did. They, they believed in Jesus and um, what he, the message he was bringing, but they weren't the same. They had slight differences amongst and they had different opinions. And we were talking about probably the two that maybe stand out the most would be Simon the Zealot. And you might be able to sort of go, he's quite liberal, if you talk about in today's terms, um, left wing. And then you have Matthew the tax collector, who's you know, the far right, Um, and just these two vastly different people, both welcome at the table and disciples of Jesus, Um, and that not being something he's worried about, and then being viewed the same, um, being loved by him the same. So that was just um, something we were talking about, and I thought was just really um, important for for today when we've had a time sort of leading up where we've probably thought about more of our differences than um, less than we've thought about how we're the same in front of God um, and with Jesus. So I welcome everyone to the table tonight and as we take communion together as equals um, all before Jesus, um, we come and we are welcome. And I'll just share um, some scripture with you from John 17, starting at verse 20. Um, and it says, I am, this is Jesus' words, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with where I am. Then they can all see the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. So I welcome you to take communion tonight. Praise you, Jesus. Precious ransom, my redeemer, truthful word, blood and body offered up. Your life has paid my debt in full. You. When I went to vote yesterday, um, down at the school here, um, they made it as hard as they could for a man and a walker to get there. Mud, 
no paths, drainage ditches that had grates on them wider than my wheels. I had to get my little walker to levitate over them and in. They, uh, the polling booths themselves were made out of cardboard. I did, I knocked the polling booth over. And they were all sort of stapled together in some way so that if you got one, you got a few. So there we went. It was big. Now this lady here, this is Mary, is it? Welcome, Mary. Um, I've had a fair bit of trouble with Rick Rutherford lately. Oh, yeah. Let's see if I can preach him into behaving himself. Um, you know, we enter in in our times to really. I was praying for Zeke the other night. And uh, I saw, like, inside of his mind, like, like tunnels with water flowing through them. But I saw you, Albert, with a brush like a chimney sweep and your prayers will brush the neural pathways of his mind and there'll be a clarity in the way he thinks the way he can concentrate and the way he can communicate. Because right now they've been blocked by a lot of different things. Um, I was very, very heartened uh, when I went to uh, to vote yesterday because I could. I was allowed to vote. Not one soldier there. Not one submachine gun in evidence. And I could vote for a lot of people. In fact, I was amazed. I could vote for the legalisation of cannabis if I was so inclined. So I could vote for uh, that I could have a rifle. So I could have a joint the rifle. That's what I could vote for yesterday. They were two of the sorts of things that were on the agenda. Um, and I, I thought to myself, well, while I don't agree while I don't agree with the positions of many, many people, and they don't agree with me either, I live in a country where we're allowed to hold different views, and I thank God for that. I thank God for that. And um, I was listening to the wash-up this morning. There was a lot of unhappy people. (laughs) And... uh, there was a, a distinct uh, lack of graciousness from a lot of people. Uh, and so the nation needs to heal and get on with living. One of the things that the pandemic has done, it has shut down lots and lots of Christian churches, uh, shut them down to the point where my friend who passed as Living Hope at, at Blacksland be had his, is having his first service for a year today. He's been streaming his services, but his first actual service today. And we have to ask ourselves, How do we live our life so that our heart is prepared for the hard times? Like that we are prepared to know, see, life is a fire and it'll melt you. And uh, whatever mould you've built of your life, that's what shape you're going to be. When I'm a kid, I used to do plaster of Paris models with rubber moulds. I remembered them today because as you'd take the mould off, you'd find somehow or other you didn't get the plaster in every part of the mould. So you'd have Mickey Mouse with no nose. You'd have Pluto with no leg. You had to make sure that you prepared the mould properly and even though the moulds were all different shapes, 
the same plaster went into all of them. So you had to make sure there was no um, there was no strange mixture and certainly no air bubbles. You used to have to prepare uh, for the pouring. And I think that um, I want to look tonight at how David prepared his heart and how some others around him didn't. David was declared king of Israel and he's crowned, he's sort of anointed and it's interesting, he's anointed with a horn of oil by the prophet Samuel in his father's house in front of his brothers. But it's 13 years between then and when he actually took the throne. There was a lot of there was a lot of waiting time between him and the anointing. And in Second Chronicles, it tells the story of a couple of David's, um, if you like, ancestors, kings before him, or kings after him, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Now these were sons of Solomon, and Solomon, of course, is David's. Uh, father, and at times it's called the wisest man that ever lived, wisest man that ever lived, but it didn't end well because he began by allowing and marrying wives of different uh, religious backgrounds, and many of them were pagans from the surrounding countryside. And what was almost universal of society in that age was they believed in child sacrifice. And really, if you like, uh, well, the reality is that abortion had its roots in those sorts of societies. And um, uh, in the city of Carthage, which is on the African coast, they discovered in the Carthaginian religion 60,000 little uh, clay bottles filled with fetuses, 60,000, which were used in religious ceremonies. So Solomon begins to bring these women into his life. Now... If you've got a thousand wives, you've got a bit of a selection problem, don't you? And uh, and there's no way that you're going to be able to. Um, well, I'm not going to go into it except to say it's not only a selection problem. Some of the women are going to have to wait a long time before they get to see you. And so there's all this sort of drama. And, and, and Solomon keep, keeps, every, he keeps his wives in order because he has eunuchs there uh, to make sure that they're kept in order. But out of, out of that one, his son who came to the throne on his death is Rehoboam. Now Rehoboam is born of a woman who is uh, an Ammonite and, and she is a good woman. And Jewish tradition tells us that she converted to Judaism and like Ruth the Moabites, another one there of foreign wives who converted, they're called in the Jewish tradition the two little doves. The two little doves. And so his mother was a good woman, but he's raised by a father who can't make up his mind what religion he is. And, and so he comes to the throne and they, the people come to see him and say, listen, will you make taxes a little easy for us? He said, my father might have, uh, might have led you with whips. I'm going to beat you with scorpions. He was a hard, hard, hard man. And the first thing he didn't do was to take any wise advice. Now, one of the things that I noticed um, during the election period, there was plenty of advice around, plenty. 
And uh, see, when you're giving people unwise advice, you don't put your hands up and say, listen, I just want to give you a bit of unwise advice here. No, no. I just want to give you a bit of BS just to get you moving. No, no, no. You're just going to say, I'm smart and you better take notice of me because if you don't, you're not smart. And, and it said of Rehoboam in Second Chronicles chapter 12, he did evil and he did not prepare his heart to do evil. And if we don't prepare our heart, we can allow our heart to grow cold. Uh, We can not follow through on what we say we're going to do. We can fall away. We can fall into sin. And I've found over the years of being a Christian for um, more than 40 years, I've seen people go through the most incredible conversion experiences that a lot of people would want and fall away. Once when I was, uh, with Tanya was living in a Christian commune of, you know, 12 houses to a street and I came home and I had a group of single women living across the road. They called it the girls' house. It was very creative, really, the girls' house. And, um, and, one of the girls there had a former boyfriend and he, um, he came along and uh, I came home with Tanya and uh, we pulled up in our driveway and he's walked out from their driveway across the road. And as I walked towards him, the power of God hit him. He went flying through the air and landed on his back in the front yard of the house. I know how this sounds, but... Um, and he, he's crying and he said, I need to repent and I want to give my heart to Jesus. Now, if every case of evangelism was as good as that, they'd be easy. And um, so I led him to Christ and he couldn't walk for a few hours anyway. We go out to a Kenneth Copeland crusade at the Horton Pavilion And on the night we go, there's a boy healed of cystic fibrosis who's running round the hall with his crutches in his hand above his head. And you say to yourself, what is this? Because my own conversion experience, I was was shocked that God actually did anything. I I thought he was just up in heaven contemplating himself, thinking about mean things he could do to keep us in line. But when I, when I encountered the love of God, the pure volcanic power of his love, it overwhelmed me. I've never, been able, I've never been able to go back from that position then. But so this man is gloriously saved. Two weeks later, he'd left the church and moved in with someone um, who he'd just met. You see, all that shakes, rattles and rolls isn't necessarily God. Flying through the air is not necessarily God either. It can be, but we've got to prepare our heart so that when we have these encounters, our heart can get what's happening to us. And we can make the right response. A lot of people during this pandemic have, um, have waned in commitment, you know, and it's not the people, it's not the people have all uh, left churches and gone somewhere else. They've just left and joined a, an internet streaming service, or they're watching their favourite preacher on TV. But it's until you begin to live your life with others that often we never face the issues in our life that need to be faced. Because we never give people the right to really speak to us. We never let them speak about anything deep. I've learned from a long time ago that if you've got a 10 tonne truck to drive into someone's life, you better have a 10 tonne bridge to drive it over. 
Too many people try and drive a 10-ton truck across a one-ton bridge and wonder why the other person runs a million miles an hour. There's a relationship that needs to be built that takes time and trust that needs to develop that takes time before a bit of reality can enter the relationship. And you can fail to prepare your heart. If I were to come here in 10 years, how many of you would be missing? How many of you would be still worshipping God? How many of you would have really gone on with it? Because one thing we're certain is, as the scripture says, adversity will come. Has anyone managed to escape adversity and get here tonight? Maybe you could take the meeting if you could tell us how you escaped any adversity in your life. You have to have plans in place. It's like the law of gravity, it's always there. When you're in the plane, it's got aerodynamic shaped wings. And it's got up there because it has been able to employ the law of lift. So it's had motors pushing it along, the winds are shaped in a particular way and you get the law of lift and up you go. Now, when you're up in the air, if they turn the engines off, you're not staying there. You're coming down, down, down. And, and uh, gravity doesn't switch itself off because it's always there. The temptation to fall away is like gravity pulling on us. The Lord is always there and you need to have a place where you overcome. Rehoboam followed God for three years and prospered and then fell away. But... Before he fell away, he was able to consult the prophets that were in his court and call off a war. Because he, the, the, um, he was forever trying to placate people. Egypt invaded him, so he stripped all the riches out of the temple and gave it to the Egyptian king, who was wealthy enough. And... He was sensitive in the law because it said he walked in the way of David, his father, but he finally succumbed to evil. The one thing you can be sure of, if you don't have a plan for yourself, the enemy has a plan for you. He has a plan for you. He has the wrong people lined up to meet you. You'll be, you'll be melted And you have to decide what sort of mould you've made of yourself. Everyone's under pressure will be squeezed into something. The good thing is that we can pick the mould. As as I get older, I find there are certain things that I would have been tempted at at 20 or 40 or 50 uh, that I'm not even tempted of now. Of course, I've allowed no mould for those things to be built in my life. To pick the mould. See, Rehoboam had not set his heart after seeking God. Saul tries to kill David when David... Saul's a good man. He's appointed king and he's a good man. But he's not God's choice of king. He's the people's choice of king. 
and talks about how handsome he was and, you know, and how he was head and shoulders above everyone else. But he was not, he was not God's choice. And he had the kingship taken off him because he was disobedient. The fundamental reason was he was frightened of what the people thought of him. He chased public opinion rather than the will of God. So he spends 13 years in the wilderness being chased by Saul. And he spends his time in a place called the Cave of Abdullah. So when he's hiding from Saul, he's hiding in the cave. As he goes into this cave to hide, his mighty men, inverted commas, um, join him. So every failure, every hothead, every person that's been bankrupt and lost their business, they become David's army, 600 of them. And he spends his time hiding out from Saul and Saul's had a few good goes at killing him. In fact, when Saul was um, doing it tough, he'd call David in to play music and sing a song for him. And a couple, of day, a couple of times he threw a javelin at David's head while he was playing. He wasn't trying to wound him, he was trying to kill him. So David learned to run. And David even went up into the land of the Philistines, who was the enemy, to the king of Gad and pretended he was crazy. So he'd slobber and scratch the walls so that the Philistines didn't think he was a warrior. They thought he was crazy. So he's in the cave with his mighty men and Saul comes in by himself to relieve himself. And David's up in the cave with his men and his men say, kill him. Kill him now. Strike him dead. And David said, I'm not going to kill him like that. He goes and cuts a little bit off his garment so he shows Saul that he could have done it. He says, I will not touch God's anointed. You'll die one day, but it won't be me that kills you. And Saul's response to that was, because you have done this, I know that one day you'll become king over all the land. You can read about that in Psalm 57. Have you set your heart, have you fixed it, have you made a commitment where you've said, this is who I am, this is what I believe, this is what I'm going to do? You know, I've been married a long time, a wonderful marriage, but I know what my wife's going to do in a lot of situations. I don't have to ask her opinion. When, and that, that precip- precipitates down into every area of life. We're watching now tonight the shadow DYI. DIY. That's where British people buy an old shadow and do it up. I know what colour walls Tanya's going to choose. I know what she's going to think of the the tiles. I know what she's going to think of the stove. Because I know her. And I know the areas where she's fixed her heart. See, David had fixed his heart and therefore he's not tempted to kill uh, Saul, who's brought a lot of unjust hardships to him. See, Saul loved David at first, but there was a song developed in the land that sort of went, Saul had killed his his thousands, David had killed his ten thousand. And the green-eyed monster rose up in Saul and that was the end of David. But David married Saul's daughter, Michal. And unlike a lot of relationships in these Old Testament times, it was a relationship of love. And when she heard her father was going to kill David, she made up a, she hid him, she helped him escape to buy him time uh, by uh, putting pillows under her blankets so they thought he was asleep. 
Now, when they, when Saul found out that Michal had escaped, had helped David escape, he immediately gave it to another man. So David had a lot of, a lot of room for resentment. Every voice, every voice in the cave is saying, kill him. But he fixed his heart. So all this extraneous noise you can push out of your life if you fix your heart. Many of you have been through tough times and you perhaps have failed God at times because you hadn't fixed your heart. When evil came, you determined you, you, you hadn't determined what you were going to do. You haven't predetermined what you would do with the rest of your life. Evil comes and you can fall into it. You can make a mess. You can feel bad. Because people don't plan to fail. As it's been said, they fail to plan. We walk away from God. It's a progressive thing. We get up tonight. We say it's pretty cold out there. The heating's not working down the club. I think they're out of the good tea bags. <laughs> They've got no name tea bags. Never. Never. <laughs> so we become step, a progressive thing. I've never lived my life where I haven't needed God 24-7. I live in constant awareness of my need of God. Like the old story of the frog in the kettle, you put the frog in the kettle and then put it on the fire, he'll stay there till he boils to death. The devil comes gradually. The key to self preservation is to fix your heart. Fixed, steadfast, non negotiable, um, uh, constant, set in concrete, unmovable. Now, our society doesn't recognise that you can fix your heart. I got amazed during the election, the swings in the polls. Albert, how are you going to ask me in the morning what I'm going to vote and ask me in the afternoon? I've changed my mind. Because the reality is we don't fix our heart. You know, that's why we've developed things like prenuptials, which is like the escape hatch if we get married. There was a guy on today um, on television. Um, uh, he was talking another language to me. I didn't know what he was talking about because he was using terms that I'm not used to. But I can say at the end that God loves him. God loves people. And gone are the days when the Christian church is going to grow by telling people they go to hell if they don't join. I'm not saying there's no hell, but I'm saying I'm glad we Christians aren't picking the ones who are in it. We'd be picking everyone who doesn't agree with us. God's love will overcome the world and has. That's why we're told in Romans, don't you know it's the kindness of God that leads men to repentance? Everyone that I know who has had a genuine conversion experience that has been crashing into and sinking on the boat of God's love God's love will overcome the world and overcome our differences. People say, if it feels good, do it. It's either true or it's not true. Our actions have consequences. 
You are determining by your decision what's happening and going to happen in your life. You can set your heart so that no matter what goes on, you already know the direction you're going to take. Psalm, um, Psalm, 3, 4 says, Psalm 34 says, I'll bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be on my, in my mouth. This is a radical approach to life is believing in God's goodness. I've seen people in the most terrible, painful times in their life discover that it's the goodness of God that surrounds them. I have decided that I will forgive. I have decided that I will love. I've decided that I'll be thankful. I'll deci- I've decided that I'll dream big. I've decided I won't believe my eyes, ears, nose. I won't believe everything I see or hear. I'll live my life for his glory. And the devil can't take that away from me and can't make me change my mind. In the garden, Jesus prayed. He said, look, if it be your will, let this cup pass away from me. I'm always conscious of the fact that Jesus had seen thousands of people crucified. They crucified people in the city centres by the side of the road so that those who walk past would know that's what's going to happen to you if you don't behave. So going to Jerusalem and being crucified, Jesus had seen that before. Now Jesus hated sin but he loved us. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He becomes sin. He suffered separation because of our sin. He knew he'd come through. That's why he made the announcement, the prince of the world comes but he has no place in me. No place in me. And then he said this, I'm not going to talk to you very much anymore. He didn't want to give people the opportunity to talk him out of it. Jesus didn't want to be tempted to give up. He didn't want, to, he didn't want the pain, but as the scripture says, who for the joy set before him he endured the cross. He he predetermined what he was going to do. Now we don't know how many months out from the event or even years out of the event that he knew the end, but he certainly knew the end uh, a long time before it happened. A lot of people fail to commit because they have too many options. Hernando Cortez sailed to America with Spanish conquistadors and as they landed on the Mexican coast, he made this determination, burn the ships. And so when those hundred or so conquistadors got off the boat, there was no way home. Burn the ships. Too many of us have like a flotilla of ships to escape escape on. We don't focus. When we say, Jesus, you're my only option, when we say divorce is not an option, when when, when when we say the commitment to marriage is not like it was, See, 50 years ago, 
We worked a 70 or 80 hour week. And uh, we worked, we had plenty of pressure. Commitment levels have waned. And you need to burn your bridges. Your life can change radically if you begin reading five psalms a day. Don't ask yourself how you feel about it. Just read five psalms. Start to read the word of God so that your inner chemistry changes. David said, my heart is fixed, O Lord. You don't want the devil to blow and you fall over. It says, in the time when kings went to war, David stayed home and that's why he found Bathsheba on the, on the roof. He wasn't meant to be there. Here's another bloke. He had a thousand wives. He didn't need Bathsheba. He didn't need that immorality in his life. He had a, he had a corporation. He had others who liked to do the fighting. He was bored. And God said to him, how could you have despised me by doing this great evil in my sight? To live our life by the fact that we can do what we like is a life of a heart that needs to be prepared and committed. In Jeremiah it says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for calamity. To give you a future and a hope. A consecrated life is the life to live. And people who are on the outside looking in might say that's a boring way to live. In my opinion, it's the only way to live. Because once I focus my life and I consecrate my life, the decision-making process is easy for my life. When I was a kid, I was easily led. And then I did plenty of leading myself. And things that I wouldn't have thought, things that I wouldn't have thought two seconds about. Many of those things could have got me killed and nearly did. Many of those things hurt other people, and they did. Now, I can say that because I'm not that person anymore, because I died with him and I rose with him. So when I talk about my past, I'm talking about a dead man, not a live man. I pray that you would never lose the grace to come to Jesus as a little child. My own father, when he was on his bed seeking God, a hopeless alcoholic, and God spoke to me, spoke to him audibly and said, unless you come to me like a little child. And he said to God, I don't know how to do that. And instantly the desire to drink left him and he was delivered. I pray for you in all areas where you need to feel the touch of God. I pray for your emotional health, for your financial well-being. I pray against the cares of this world that you would know the peace that only Jesus can bring. I pray the Lord would bless you. I pray he would keep you. I pray his love would touch you, minister to the deepest places of your woundedness and pain and bring you healing. I thank you, Jesus. Amen.